Kyoto, no mai, hari mai. Welcome to all alumni and friends of the University of Auckland to Raising the Bar Auckland Home Edition. My name is Mark Bentley. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Development, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Now, I'm sorry to say that this is the final episode in our series for 2020. So if this is the first time you've tuned in, well, where on earth have you been for a start? Because it's been great. You've missed a, a super series, uh, but we're going to finish on a high, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. The series has had six great talks over six weeks, and we rebooted a concept that, we, that used to take place once a year in 10 Auckland bars and put it online. So we hope you've enjoyed it. Just six weeks ago, we kicked off from Tracy McIntosh's lockdown kitchen, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, here we are in New Zealand. At least we're down to level one, and we're starting to get back to normality. We hope that you're faring well, wherever you might be in the world. So we thought we would end the series on a high, and we've therefore picked an uplifting topic. Impact investment offers renewed hope to those tackling some of the world's most stubborn social and environmental problems. And Drs. Deb Shepard and Jamie Newth from the Business School will shortly explain more. Now, I just want to point you uh, to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That is now live. And during the talk, we'd really be delighted if you could submit any questions you might have for Deb and Jamie. So they'll be monitoring those as we go along and they will answer as many as they can later on. Uh, you'll also be able to upvote any questions that you particularly like, so keep an eye on that. So a little bit about Deb and Jamie. Uh, Deb's research and teaching focuses on social, social entrepreneurship and innovation. She's a founding facilitator of the Ice House's Owner Manager Program, a director of impact investment firm, Stoll Capital, and she holds a small business advisory role with government. Now, Jamie's a founder of Soul Capital and a member of the National Advisory Board for Impact Investment. His research focuses on social innovation and entrepreneurship, and his teaching covers experiential learning for startup entrepreneurs. So we put you in very safe hands tonight. Over to you, Deb and Jamie. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to the Raising the Bar team, can I just say congratulations. This is the final session of a full-on six weeks of bringing the home edition to, to everyone. So well done, team. Uh, you will definitely be looking forward to that wine at the end of this session, I'm sure. Also, um, can I say on behalf of Jamie and I that we are really delighted to be here um, and part of this home edition. It's uh, a great privilege to be asked. And I would also like to say a big thank you to the previous speakers Crikey, they certainly did raise the bar and um, being last is no small feat following their, their great presentations. If you haven't seen them, please tune in and check them out. Most importantly though, can I say welcome and it's great to have you all, wherever you are, uh, join us this evening and um, to be part of this, this series and this event. So welcome. I hope that in the spirit of raising the bar that you have a wine in front of you. Sadly, Jamie and I only have a water at this stage, but uh, I'm sure at the end of it, we will, we will get a wine. So welcome, and I hope that you enjoy the, the presentation. As Mark said, there will be Q&A at the end of the session. So please, as we are going through this presentation, feel free to uh, drop in your questions or insights that you want to share or thoughts that are on your mind. So who are we and what are we going to talk about? Well, as Mark has already said, both Jamie and I are on staff here at the University of Auckland Business School, where we both teach in the area of entrepreneurship with a particular focus on social entrepreneurship. Additionally, however, and uh, particularly relevant to the presentation tonight, is that we are both actively engaged in the, in the business community and um, most especially in the social entrepreneurship ecosystem mouthful first thing in the evening um, and in that we have a variety of different roles from board members to investors and also we act as advisors so as we think about all of those roles that we take um, into the presentation this evening we will draw on our insights from each of those particular roles so there'll be a little bit of a theoretical overview or um, frameworks to think about 
We will also draw on some research that Jamie and his team did for the Responsible Investment Association Australasia. And then we will be sharing our own experience from the field, if you will, uh, from Sol Capital, which we will give some more detail about later on in this presentation. Before we begin, however, um, let me just provide a few introductory and positioning comments that, that will help set the scene. In 2017, Jamie and I were uh, part of the inaugural Raising the Bar event, and uh, that was actually in a bar back then, pre-COVID times, and we shared some thoughts on social entrepreneurship. Our assumption as we went into that is, apart from the fact that we'd coerced our partners, parents, thanks mum and dad, um, and our kids, thanks kids, into the audience. We had no idea who was in, uh, in the bar having a drink and listening to us talk about social entrepreneurship. And so we pitched it at the interested, curious, but may not know a whole lot about it. And so that is the same pitch that we're bringing into this evening's presentation. If you're an expert in impact investing, then um, share your thoughts and ideas and insights in the Q&A because we would, uh, love to share those with everyone else um, and for those of you who are less sure about impact investing then certainly that is the that's the perspective that we are coming at this conversation tonight so we hope that you have a coffee if it's morning wherever you're tuning in from or a wine or some other other beverage if uh, you are here in new zealand to sit back and enjoy uh, the presentation mark suggested in his introduction that this would be uplifting and certainly by the time we get to the end of our, our talk we would uh, love for you to leave feeling that this is uplifting and that there is a sense of hope but I will also um, revisit that in 2017 when we spoke about social entrepreneurship and um, social enterprises in the emerging field back then a lot of what we were exploring and interested in were some of the intractable or um, wicked problems, social, economic, and uh, the many injustices and, and challenges that communities were facing and how social entrepreneurship had provided a vehicle or another way of thinking about some of these issues. So too is the backdrop for impact investing. And it's not lost on us that we are doing this via Zoom. Uh, we aren't in a bar, uh, even though, as Mike said, it is level one now and we could be. This series was um, born out of the fact that we were at home and we had an international pandemic. Globally, we've seen considerable social unrest, as evidenced most recently in the Black Lives Matter movement. And there's growing concern among many that the status quo that we are operating within, both economically and politically, is not only failing to address the social and environmental issues that we are facing globally, but in fact may indeed be exacerbating them. So if we use that as a somewhat depressing but real backdrop for thinking about impact investing, what is it that we are interested in? And I suppose most importantly, we don't see impact investing in a very narrow view of the world. What we're interested in is how that is part of a much broader movement, a much broader paradigm shift that fundamentally questions some of the binary or dualistic thinking that has underpinned much of our economic activities. In particular, we have a, an environment where we see for profit on the one hand, and, and what that means is pretty clear to us. That's all about focusing primarily on earnings. And then on the other hand, we have not-for-profits, charities, trusts, etc., which are primarily focused on purpose. And as a result of that, investment or capital flows in a very similar binary manner. So we see that people who uh, invest in for-profits have an expectation of financial return or and it is an or they give to philanthropic um, and activities or they give to trusts, grants, etc. And we want to challenge that and say, what does it look like to think more from a hybrid or blended perspective rather than the dualistic either or? And so that essentially is what our curiosity stems from. What does a both and proposition look like? How can we create both financial return on investment and be very clear about impact and purpose without 
hierarchically prioritizing one over the other. So as we think about that, we look at uh, impact investment, not from the perspective that it's some panacea, that it is the answer, and that as a result of that, there's no place anymore for philanthropic work or for trusts, for not-for-profits or indeed government. There absolutely is. Um, but what we do question is how might our investment theses, how might our investment activities move towards investing for social change, for social good, and perhaps be more purposeful and focused in that endeavour? So if we think about that and, and ask ourselves, what does impact investing mean? Uh, like most academics, we uh, defer at some point to a, a definition that, that sets the scene. Jamie, over to you to pick it up. Well, thanks, Deb, um, and welcome um, everyone wherever in the world you may be. And just want to echo um, Deb's comments that hopefully you've got a, a time appropriate um, beverage in hand. Um, and if you have, given that we can go into bars, if you have taken uh, your device into a bar and uh, um, enjoying this talk in a bar on whatever device it is, um, applaud your um, you know, working in the spirit of raising the bar, but you may have taken things um, a little bit too far, um, but, but good on you anyway. Um, and just remember, um, and again, echoing um, Deb's point, um, that we can't see your faces right now. So we don't know how this stuff is landing. Um, we can't see your eye rolls. We can't see if you're confused or whether you're bored because um, this is going to be you know, relatively high level. Um, so if you do want clarification or you want to go further down the rabbit hole, um, please do, do make use of that, um, that Q&A function and do just ask. Um, so it's over to me to, to talk about what is impact investing. But before I do that, I want to talk about why impact investing um, and why does it matter? I mean, Deb alluded to this, um, that, yeah, we're going to talk about deals that we have done via our, our company. Um, and particular um, examples of impact investment and that kind of thing, but um, and, and quite what it is and, and show you some, um, some pretty pictures. Um, but we mustn't forget that this is part of a movement towards doing our economy differently. I think it's probably the financial vanguard of doing our economy differently. Um, and that means doing our economy in a way which is systemically more sustainable and more inclusive. Um, and how do we drive, how do we have an economy which is more sustainable and more inclusive? Well, one of the important things there is to have enterprises and projects that will take, that will put a dent in those grand challenges, those intractable problems, um, social and environmental. And impact investment is the capital, it's the fuel um, for the growth of those enterprises and those projects. Um, so that's, that's why it's so important. Um, and it challenges, as Deb was saying, the long-held views that social and environmental issues should be addressed only by philanthropic donations um, and government intervention, and that market um, investments should focus exclusively on achieving financial returns. Um, so what is it? Let's, let's look at the definition here. So impact investments are investments. So let's make that point really clear from the get-go. They are financial investments. Um, but made with that simultaneous intent, both to generate positive um, and measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Um, that intent, that word intent and the word measurable are really important in this definition. We'll, we'll come back to those um, a little bit later. Um, so that's what it is in, in really simple terms. Um, but it's important to note that this is, um, impact investing can occur and has, has the promise that, that we're evangelizing a little bit here, both in emerging markets and in developing markets, can target a range of returns from below market rate to market rate, depending on um, the investor's strategic goals, the agenda, and, and what impact you're, um, you're looking to have, and what stakeholders um, you're, you're working with. Um, and the, the growing impact investment market provides capital to address the world's most pressing challenges in really diverse sectors, such as sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, conservation, microfinance, affordable and accessible basic services, including housing, healthcare, and education. So we're going to talk about some specific examples, but don't want you to think that you know, that's only where impact and in, investing happens. Um, so that's impact investing in words. This is essentially saying similar things um, with some pictures. Um, and conveniently, we've got a, a two by two matrix, which um, academics and consultants love. Um, and two things are always true of two by two matrices. 
the top right hand quadrant is always the most interesting um, and they're always to some degree um, an oversimplification um, and both both are true here um, but I think they they do illustrate the point really well so along the the x-axis along the bottom there we can see that um, just like we would if we're um, a philanthropist grant maker individual donor if we're parting with with our money on that basis we expect to see a minimum level of impact yeah social and environmental so that's our that's our impact floor and likewise on the y-axis there um, when we're investing we expect some kind of minimum financial return risk adjusted financial return for our investment what we're saying with impact investing is we're combining those two things um, and therefore we have our you know utopian top right hand um, uh, quadrant um, where we've got yeah, a minimum impact that we're looking to achieve and a minimum financial return. Um, now there's a whole lot of nuance which isn't apparent um, within that quadrant. We've pulled out a little bit there that you know within there you've got those investors that prioritize the financial returns. Yes there's got to be a minimum level of impact um, but financial returns are of primary importance and then there's those that where the financial returns yes there's a financial return minimum um, but they're in it really primarily um, for the impact. But there's a whole lot more nuance in there in terms of the types of investors, the types of um, investment instruments they're using, the assets they're investing in, and what they're trying to achieve. So again, it's, it's, this is an oversimplification. This is less simple um, and problematically wordy and large and complex for a slide when you're already um, a couple of glasses deep into raising the bar. Um, but it's still very, very useful, yeah? And we are academics, so we need to bore you a little bit. Um, what this depicts, and if you ever Google impact investing or social entrepreneurship, you'll end up with a spectrum um, of some kind like this. Um, now, why is it laid out left to right like this? Not because you move from left being traditional investment and that's where all the best financial returns are and they get worse as you go right. That's not true. What happens is you move left to right on this, um, on this diagram is the intent behind what you're doing with your capital moves from a priority less around just the financial return and more towards the impact that you're looking to have. So you would have heard a lot and seen a lot and maybe changed your KiwiSaver provider or, or um, something like that because of things around in this gray area in the middle, which is this increasing movement that is now, I think we can say pretty mainstream um, that we want our investments to at least be responsible, sustainable, and ethical. Um, and that is generally done by, um, towards the left, screening out things we don't agree with or we believe to be harmful, we're not wanting them in our, our portfolio. So that's an um, avoidance of harm kind of logic. Um, as we move more towards the right, yes, we're still we're trying to avoid harm and we may be screening in things that we think are best in class and are positively impactful. Um, but we're really looking to benefit particular stakeholder groups and, and really what we're talking about today um, is this panel here um, towards the far right where um, yes it benefits stakeholders but it's also actively contributing to solutions. So it's a belief that this particular investment vehicle that we're investing in will actually contribute to a solution um, to, a, to an identified problem. Um, and down in the orange and, and teal down here um, you know that there's this is a driving intent behind the investment is um, is to deliver that impact um, and that and we're going to talk about this a little bit later that the measurability and measuring that impact is really fundamental to the integrity behind what we're doing um, so we're not just investing and hoping we're investing and measuring and making sure that we are actually delivering on um, on the impact that that we're looking to have so who's doing it well, everyone, really, or potentially, and, and in theory. Um, so certainly all types of investors and all types of assets can embed impact into their investment strategies. And globally, um, the, the invest, global investment, impact investment market is estimated to be around $500 billion. Now you may think that's a large number or a really small number. Um, either position is actually right, um, because it is a relatively small number in the scheme of things in terms of the investment market. But it's an encouragingly large number and that that is um, significant there's a lot of sophistication behind that money but at the same time it's growing growing rapidly um, but in terms of that that gray stuff in the middle the responsible investment 
that's already in the many, many trillions of dollars, um, particularly those that we, we can identify as being signed up under the principles for responsible investment under the UN. Um, and interestingly, I was talking in theory about returns and them not necessarily decreasing as you move right. What we are seeing is that sustainable and responsible investments are outperforming so-called traditional investments for lots of reasons which we can dig into in, in the Q&A if you want. Um, so we're going to talk primarily today when we talk about examples about social enterprises and businesses as the investment vehicle. Um, but you can see here that um, different types of investors can achieve impact in, in a range of different um, investment classes. So if you're an individual investor, um, if listening to this, to this talk, um, and you're not high net worth, or if you are high net worth, or if you're a trustee of a trust, um, if you're a director of an um, investment organization, whatever else, there's a way in which you can participate in this. So those options may be slightly limited, but they're growing and there's things that you can do. So banks, pension funds, financial advisors, and wealth managers can provide client investment opportunities to both individuals and institutions with an interest in general or specific social and environmental causes. Institutionals and family foundations can leverage significantly greater assets to advance their core social and or environmental goals while maintaining or even growing their overall endowment. And governments, development finance institutions um, can really crowd in other investors by providing the proof that we need to legitimize this stuff, provide pr proof of the financial viability for private sector investors while targeting um, those specific um, social and environmental impacts. So that's great. Um, for us to be talking in kind of in theory um, and what's happening globally but um, we might want to know what's actually happening um, here in New Zealand because we can answer our questions that we started off with with why does it matter and can you invest um, and get a financial return and, and have a positive impact um, and we could just say yes um, and it'd be a short um, and uninspiring talk so we thought um, let's give you some evidence that um, of what's actually going on here so um, this is a report that um, Audrey Water and I survey and report um, that Audrey and I did for the Responsible Investment Association Australasia. I um, encourage you to jump on, um, on their website and, and download a copy of that. And um, it's uh, yeah, riveting, a riveting reading, really it is. Um, and um, the survey was um, really to investigate the awareness, the interest and the activity of impact investment in New Zealand, the shape of investor demand and the, um, the future of, demand for impact investment and the challenges um, that we face in, in growing that market. Um, and this is a boring slide in the table with some numbers on it. Um, but when you dig into it, it's actually, I think, relatively interesting. So what it says to us is that um, one pretty good sample, nicely representative sample of, um, of the um, investment sector in New Zealand from um, NZ Super, our sovereign wealth fund, being the biggest investor in this in the country and in, in our um, sample, um, which we removed from this data because they were distorting it um, and wrote a profile in them with their permission to, um, to identify them and talk about what they're doing in terms of impact investing. And I encourage you to have a look at that in the report. Um, but it says um, that we can see that across different types of investors, there's act impact investment activity. Um, and down the bottom right here, we can see that you know the and this was not methodologically. This was not trying to size the market per se. It was just about insights. But um, looking at the data and being close enough um, to the action, we know that this is pretty close to, to where we think the um, the market size is in New Zealand. So that's eight hundred eighty nine million dollars down the bottom right there. Again, you may think that's a large number or a small number. Um, the exciting thing is where that number is likely to go in the next few years, which we'll get to. Um, but I just want to point out a couple of things um, on this slide, a couple of categories. So firstly is individuals, family offices, um, and trust foundations and not-for-profits. So these two types of investor, we'll call them that, um, are doing two things naturally anyway. Yeah, They're investing for commercial returns, and they are donating, providing grants of some kind to uh, address social and environmental issues. Logically, as you get more sophisticated on both of those things, you start to think, well, how can I, rather than just maximizing the financial returns 
on the investment side of that equation and then distributing those in ways that I think are appropriate. How can I do those distributions but also have an impact with that investment capital? So these groups in particular, we can expect to see, um, I think the most natural and easiest path to increased impact investing. The data does bear that out. But where does the real volume come from? When we start doing this at scale, it comes from our, our investment managers. So um, these are the, your, um, your high street um, investment managers that are um, working with some of those other investor types, um, managing your Kiwi savers um, and so on. So whilst $315 million um, is, a, is an interesting and significant amount, in the scale of what they are, the assets under management, AUM, of what they're currently managing, um, it's, it's not significantly large yet. So we'll cherry pick um, a few other um, findings which we think are, are particularly interesting. Um, so we asked uh, active impact investors, you know, what financial returns do they expect? Um, and interestingly, they had really high financial return expectations. So 74% of them were looking for market rate returns or better. Interesting, those expectations are higher from, than those that are not yet um, investing um, in impact investment. So that's interesting. What's more interesting is not only do they have high financial return expectations, but those expectations are being met or exceeded increasingly. Um, and not only that, um, their, the impact performance of those investments are also really, really strong. So that says, I think, a couple of things. One, it says, can you invest for financial return and have a positive impact in New Zealand? Yes, you can. These investors are already doing it and, and have a track record which says that it's working for them. But it also says that these early adopters, those that are moving into the space first, are doing so because um, the returns are strong. And like I said before, there's a whole range of different impact and types of impact investment to achieve different types of impact in different ways. And not all of them have high financial returns and appropriately so. Um, and so if those that are lower financial return um, that we really need to build the market out for, for impact investment to, to fully um, deliver on its promise. So, last slide talking about data, I promise. So we can see um, that, you know, it's not the market size of the market, but at the moment we can see that um, we've got roughly $900 million of impact investment um, deployed in, in the economy. The really interesting thing and the exciting thing is that um, there's a huge amount of interest and appetite um, from within that sample, and it's only the sample, it's only a sample, um, to increase that. Um, and so within, in the medium term, to increase that to um, just under $6 billion um, in five plus years. So that's more than a six-fold increase. Um, and so that's, um, that's really, really promising. Um, we talked about the, the returns, uh, expectations around return are high, but they're generally being, being met and that is delivering on the impact side of the equation as well. Um, there's some interesting findings which you can dive into in terms of what kind of sectors are, are is attracting impact investment capital and what the priorities are. Um, but one of the challenges that we have um, in New Zealand is to, you know, remove the barriers or what are the, the enablers that to um, help that six billion dollars um, actually move and get deployed. Um, one of them is the availability of investable deals. So this is the pipeline of deals which, which investors um, could realistically invest in. Now every investor in the world wants a better pipeline so yes that is you know, a barrier but it's also just what investors are looking for. They want more investable deals but that's just a, a function or a product sorry of the, the nascent state of our market. Um, and the rest is track record. Um, track record and evidence and bench benchmarks of um, that this kind of investment uh, can deliver the social impact and the financial return. So this kind of research is very useful um, for that. Um, but it also requires um, other forms of leadership as well. Um, so now you're thinking, okay, that's great. You're evangelizing the stuff and you're throwing some a little bit of theory and a bunch of data at us, but do you as speakers on this Raising the Bar um, actually get out of your ivory tower and um, do something about it? Um, it's gonna tell you exactly what that looks like. Thanks, Jamie. So let us uh, share with you a little bit about Soul Capital. Soul Capital was founded in 2014. That's hard to believe, isn't it, when you uh, look at Jamie's young face. 
by Jamie and uh, following the, the founding of Soul Capital, he convinced and captured many of us to participate in and get involved in his journey and share his vision. What Soul Capital is all about is exploring what it would mean to build a community of businesses, of entrepreneurs, of investors and other key stakeholders who all share a common goal, a common aspiration to tackle some of the really critical, what Mark described as those stubborn social and environmental problems. So from its outset, Soul Capital has been about engaging with multiple stakeholders, creating an environment for dialogue, for conversation, for agitation, for encouragement, and ultimately looking to connect people who are wanting to participate and be active in this space. One of, in addition to the, the network events and the engagement part of Soul Capital, one of the other particularly critical aspects is what we call, have uh, named the AFI Fund. And the AFI Fund is New Zealand's first impact investment fund, uh, named AFI because that means to nurture and to embrace. And while the AFI Fund was a small fund by comparison to many of the investment funds that many of you would be familiar with, it, its intention was very much around catalyzing the market, providing some leadership and to hopefully act as a, a vehicle that other people would come in behind and support. So the investment thesis underpinning the AFI is very much that blended hybrid nature that we have talked about through this presentation. That is, there was an absolutely an expectation around a return on investment. This was not about philanthropic or charity or donation. So there was very much a financial underpinning and from that we, was, and we were expecting that there would be clear markets, clear customers, clear revenue streams and all of the sorts of things that you would expect to see in traditional business investing. Additionally though, and critically, this idea of impact was absolutely necessary from the get-go and needed to be what we uh, phrase as baked in to the philosophy. That is that there was very clear, there was a very clear articulation by both the founder and his or her team around what problem they were seeking to solve, an understanding of that problem from a very systemic perspective, and an articulation, albeit often in a, in a very challenging way, around how that impact might be measured. So our investment criteria that underpin the AFI Fund are around the, as I said, the validated market, expected revenue, the customer, and the addressable um, opportunity. We didn't limit ourselves around sector or around a particular industry focus. There was absolutely a uh, expectation, as I've mentioned, around the um, backing the founder, as you would see in any type of investment due diligence. And then, most importantly, this demonstrable commitment to impact. So we endeavoured right from the get-go to blend and hybridise to the best of our ability and answer the question that we posed for ourselves in this presentation, and that is, could we get both financial returns and achieve positive impact through investing in, in a variety of different companies or ventures? So, as you can see on the screen in front of you, today we have invested, along with others, in five really exciting startups. And I'm just going to go through each of them briefly to give you a sense both of what they do and the type of impact that they are looking to achieve. So, on our top left, if we look at that, Kogo, that's all about, that's byline, ethical living made easy. So Kogo is about a digital marketing platform that essentially enables you as a consumer, as a buyer, to think about how you are consuming and to be able to track and improve the spending aligned with the values that you hold dear. So for instance, if you have a particular interest in organic food or you want businesses to adhere to a living wage philosophy, if sustainable business practices are really important to you, then this platform enables you to find those businesses and then be able to purchase from them. 
And really excitingly, most recently, uh, Kogo has entered into a partnership with Westpac, whereby you will be able to track in real time your carbon footprint, thus enabling you to think about your own action around climate change. So essentially, it's about us thinking about our consumption from a, from a conscious perspective. Grounded, if we go over to the, the right-hand side, that's all about providing innovative and sustainable packaging to businesses in one easy to use end-to-end -end platform. So we know that many businesses grapple with how do they package, how do they ship, how do they work with uh, packaging companies in a way that doesn't compromise their product, doesn't compromise their sustainability goals. And so Grounded has set out to try and make that easy for businesses by providing best-in-class sustainable packaging. Bottom left, we have Regen. Uh, Regen is all about trying to improve environmental, economic and sustainability outcomes for farming. We know that that is uh, particularly topical at the moment and um, really challenging, but what it offers, is, offers to the farmers is automated recommendations that provide reporting and alerts for proactive farm management, which enables farmers, many of whom are very committed to achieving environmental and sustainability goals. So their sensors, their software, and their reporting mechanisms enable farmers essentially to manage the, the runoffs that um, provide challenges to their, their local waterways. Bottom right hand, hand corner is UBI. UBI stands for Out of Our Own Backyard. And UBI is all about wanting to rebuild local and small scale resilient food economies. We think about what's happened to our food um, manufacturing, well, starting with the growers through the manufacturing, through to distribution and retail, it's become very corporatized. And the challenge with that is it becomes very difficult for consumers to get organic, to get fresh, to get local food delivered. And it's really difficult for smallhold farmers to participate and engage in a competitive way when large becomes the dominant way of doing business. So Ubi is all about uh, trying to bring back much more local engagement between farmers and retailers, whereby packaging is minimised, whereby food um, carbon footprint and, and food miles are minimised, and there are no chemicals in the products. So a very different way of consuming than we would get in some of our traditional retails, retail stores. And then in the middle, we have Cara Technologies. And Cara Technologies are very focused. They are all about making content accessible to the deaf community. The founder, Arish, uh, suffered from a, an illness where he, whereby he lost some of his hearing. And because of that, he became acutely aware of the fact that when looking around his community, he wondered where all of the deaf people were. And part of the problem was that they did not have access to content. They didn't have access to video, voice or text in any kind of real time manner. And although we have seen a lot of um, translation in recent times through COVID, that is somewhat unusual and it's certainly not what characterizes society for deaf people. So for CARA, engagement is all about inclus inclusion of those people who are deaf. So when we think about what does this look like from an impact point of view, if you drop into the middle of this slide and see the outputs, they are the things that we would ordinarily think about measuring. They're, you know, they, they're more easy to measure for a start. They're things like how many farmers are supplying these customers, how many of them are certified organic, how many boxes are being delivered, what are the kilometers that are being traveled. These are things that we can measure quite simply. That's great and that's a great start, but when we push out towards the outcomes and the impact side of, the, of this model, it gets a little trickier but this is ultimately the kinds of impact implications that the, the businesses are endeavoring to achieve. So what they are, through their, their problem identification, trying to achieve is something much greater than just numbers. 
So whilst we would expect in any of these impact models, for instance, revenue to increase or customers to increase or any of the other typical measurements, alongside that, we're also looking for that to increase impact proportionately. And if it doesn't, then the impact model starts to fall apart. So if doing more of something actually starts to have unintended negative consequences, then the impact model becomes compromised. And that's the type of issue that we start to explore when we are really focused in on what it means to be an impact investor. So that kind of model, that theory of change, which we've um, just used as an example there um, for Ubi, um, is not new. That, that kind of modeling and, and um, thinking about how a leads to B, which leads to C, um, has been around for a long time. It's not an impact investing thing. That's a, a, an intervention thing of any kind from not-for-profits and NGOs um, for, for a long time. Um, so it's the principles that, um, which we're going to talk about in a second, which make sure that, in, that, in, that integrity is maintained um, in spite of the fact that it's been achieved via a business and via um, an investment logic. Um, I'll just to talk very briefly about Cara Technologies. So as um, Deb talked about, um, this is about providing accessibility to, to content um, for the Dev community. And how they do that is via artificial intelligence, which drives um, this hyper real avatar. This is Nikki looking very frustrated um, um, at the moment, but I assure you she's um, translating that book. Um, and you may think, well, what's the problem that Cara is looking to solve here? And, and let's think about that, that theory of change or that logic model. You say, well, that's around access to this kind of content for educational purposes, because if you um, are deaf from birth, um, it's really hard to learn to read when you can't hear someone um, sounding out um, words to you. Um, and so um, your reading age, if you're in your early 20s, is likely to be around eight, and you can imagine the, the life outcomes that, that flow from that. Um, so you could think about that, you can map that out from a, um, addressing an educational issue. But one of the really exciting things about CARA from an impact investor's perspective is that it's really smart um, and relatively deep technology. Um, but also there isn't an expression of this technology, whether it be in an educational context, whether it's Netflix or YouTube or um, whatever expression of it, which isn't impactful. Um, and so you can see big commercial opportunities in that, um, but there's justice being brought to a community which is underserved and by every, every expression of it. Um, modeling it is a little bit more challenging, but we can, through our due diligence, understand you can't take impact out of this business if you try. Um, and that's really what we're, um, what we're looking for. So just conscious of time, so I'm going to um, skip ahead to some final thoughts and we'll jump into the Q&A. So now is the time to really start um, chucking your, your questions into, that, into the um, Q&A. Um, so why does it matter? I think hopefully we've, we've um, really touched on this. So impact investing holds great promise as a tool for positive change because it embeds positive impact into financial tools um, that traditionally focus only on commercial value creation. So in this way, it really harnesses that private sector mechanisms um, and capital to address social and environmental issues in ways complementary to the efforts of, of government and philanthropy. Um, and like I said, it, it provides the fuel for the enterprises and projects that will take us towards an economy that is inclusive and sustainable. Um, and you think about the power of that, the machinery of the private, private sector, if we can bring purpose, put humanity back into it, um, so that that positive impact is intentional rather than being incidental, an incidental outcome of, of economic growth, that's exciting, that's compelling. Um, intentionality, additionality, measurements, fundamental, right? So um, yeah, responsible investing is great. This is a form of it, that you're an impact investor when you're in investing with that intent to solve a particular problem, yeah? It's additional and additive, you know, your investment will make a difference to, the, to that problem. Um, and then you're committed to measuring because you care about measurement you know, actually delivering the impact that you, that you seek to um, achieve. That's why I've said measurement as integrity. Um, because it's about in putting integrity into your investment, so you're, it's not just a reporting function. So you can report to your stakeholders that, yeah, we did impact investing. And so you can say that we did impact investing in a way which actually delivered on the impact. It's not being used as a screen or a shield um, um, to um, greenwash or impact wash um, your portfolio. 
but this stuff is hybrid, right? So the ecosystems for doing traditional investment and doing traditional philanthropy are well developed, that capital's on rails. Um, but this hybrid ecosystem, and this is a key part of our research agenda, is how do we um, have the institutions and the ecosystems which deliver um, on, on the exciting stuff we're talking about. And you should be wondering, well, what's this, how does this um, fit with the Māori economy and, and Māori investment and enterprise principles? Um, so this is all happening against a backdrop um, of increased assets under management among iwi and other Māori organisations that don't and never have separated societal wellbeing from commerce. Um, so yes, we may be behind other countries that we would compare ourselves to in terms of the scale of impact investing, but we've got a huge platform here and arguably a real opportunity to um, drive a unique national identity for impact investment on the back of of um, Māori enterprise and, and investment principles. Um, and I think we've made the point, this is not about delegitimizing philanthropy. You should totally keep donating to the university or you alumni. Um, that's not what we're saying here. Um, I could keep talking, but we need to get into the, to the Q&A. We absolutely do. Uh, thanks, Jamie. So folks, I'm going to endeavor to whip through these questions that we have coming up here and Jamie and I will answer them and brevity is our friend. So how can we invest in these companies? Darwin, just contact Jamie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is not our offer of securities in the public, so, to the public, so don't sue me for saying this. Um, but yeah, you can reach out to us. Cara is raising capital presently. Kogo is raising capital um, presently. Disclaimers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, um, they, you can reach out to us or them. Great. How will impact is, uh, sorry, how will investors know whether social enterprises are really having an impact? I think I'll just start off um, by saying to this person that the critical thing here is that impact investors, when you work through a vehicle like Soul or like Purpose Capital or Impact Enterprise Fund, there is an expectation that impact is measured and reported. And whilst it's difficult and challenging, that is the expectation. So if you do invest through those sorts of funds, then there is an opportunity to work alongside the fund manager in understanding what impact looks like, how it will be measured and how you will be kept abreast of that. So, so as a, just to add to that, as an impact investor, that, that measurement function is Yes, it's a hygiene thing in that how do we make sure they're having, having the impact, but it's also, and for reporting and that kind of thing, but it's also a strategic function. So you use that to improve your impact. Um, so that's the only real, that's why I call impact you know, measurement as integrity, because we want to make sure that integrity stays baked into our impact investments. Oh, sorry, just bounced around on my screen. So Greta has asked, is Soul Capital engaged with worker cooperative or other groups that may not be strictly non-profit, but involve worker control of capital? Do you see impact investment being a potential way of promoting these businesses or initiatives? So um, Soul Capital doesn't invest in non-profits generally. Um, in fact, we, we can't really because of um, the financial returns um, uh, that we're looking for. Um, and so we're not engaged with any worker cooperatives um, per se, um, but worker cooperatives, um, co-ops generally, um, the solidarity economy, which is often referred to particularly in South America, are examples of um, embedding certain principles and managing power within an enterprise to ensure um, that it's achieving um, certain outcomes. So that can be a little bit more challenging to invest into just because of the ownership structure. Um, but these are really old models that still have relevance in currency to ensure that certain stakeholders retain their voice, um, particularly where ownership has been separated from management. And we could talk a lot about this in terms of new models of, of legal forms of companies to embed stakeholder voice, whether it be B Corps in the US, mm. um, community interest companies um, in the UK. Um, so there are other vehicles that are, are very specifically addressing those sorts of initiatives, Greta, and um, yeah, ask us if you would like further information about those. So I have a question here about what can research do to enhance social impact of investing? And um, it's a great question. And one of the, there's a couple of 
answers to that. One is that we need some longitudinal research to show what impact and what financial returns uh, impact investing achieves over time. And because this is a relatively nascent and emerging field, we, we certainly need longitudinal research to address that. And also to understand what drives investors into particular types of uh, investment and also to understand more about how do we really measure impact. You've seen through our presentation today that it can be challenging, uh, that there are some high level, relatively easy or accessible measurements, but then when we go down to that next layer of, of impact, it can be more challenging. And so research that can support and enhance our understanding of that would be great. Jamie, one for you. Apart from the work you are doing, bounce, what else is the university doing to help grow impact investing? That one's for me, is it? That's uh, for you. That's called the, you know, you're on the wing. Just catch it as it comes out your way. Yes, as I'm about, to, it's called a hospital pass too, because of whom I'm about to get tackled by. Um, the, so there's um, little in terms of, uh, curricular programs um, and there's, um, there are some researchers who are exploring the space. There's far more in terms of the sustainable and, and responsible investment. We need to do give a shout out that we have been rated um, as uh, the, the most sustainable university in the world um, against the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but this is something which is um, increasingly when, when we give students the flexibility to express what they're interested in in terms of the types of enterprise and the way they want to invest and we respond to that as um, educators, we are to increasingly talking about this stuff, not necessarily calling it impact investment and social entrepreneurship, although frequently are, um, but really thinking about well, how do you embed these, that kind of purpose into frameworks, into a curriculum into in the experiential um, accelerator programs we run, who are, who are the investors that want to invest in this hybrid entity and what would be their value proposition for why they'd invest in, in, in that kind of thing. Um, so um, the university is moving, um, um, but we've got, to be honest, we've got work to do. And we'll keep going uh, with both that work and with the questions. <laughs> so here's a, an interesting, question that, that brings together some of our portfolio companies. Is taking a portfolio level approach for impact investing important? Sol Capital's investment portfolio looks to have some interesting synergies. That is, UB perhaps using grounded services and sourcing from region farmers. Does this open the potential for greater scale and impact and therefore a better impact return proposition for the investors? They think about the portfolio rather than the individual entities. And the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, it, but with with some limitations because yeah. uh, so that logic is is really solid. Um, I guess typically what you'd see from a, a, a typical investor, um, and a, even a, a large scale international impact investor will probably focus on a geography and a particular sector. So you may be about agricultural technology in East Africa, for example. We have an agenda here of really agitating and moving the local impact ecosystem. Yeah, so we're staying domestic, which means we are fishing in a, in a smaller pond. So Deb talked about the investment thesis and the criteria that we would look for, um, and, but we're constrained by the, just the volume of investable deals. So yes, I did, as much as possible, we do those kinds of things, just even from a, a risk perspective, risk mit mitigation perspective. Um, but we are constrained in terms of the, the, the quantity of investable deals. So yes, but we have some, some challenges in terms of um, the options that we have. Thank you. Um, Shelley's curious about whether this is the next stage of triple bottom line in businesses. Um, certainly we would suggest that yes, it's absolutely about a multiplicity of, me of measurements. It's not about privileging only financial, but exploring what else. As well as measuring from a triple bottom line perspective, I guess our um, next stage of challenge is to say, and what is the greater impact that that collectively has? Shelley, I hope that didn't cut short your question. And in the um, spirit of timing here, we've only got time for a couple more. 
is there such a thing as angel impact investing? And the answer to that is yes, because you're looking at two of them. Um, and there is a kind of a growing community of people who are interested in this, but it is still very much at early stage. Jamie, do you want to pick that up? Angel, well, and angel investors have always invested for reasons beyond just the financial return of potential, right? It's because they are drawn to something, they want to get involved in something, they want to give back because they've become wealthy from growing a business, whatever it is. So this is another interesting um, interesting thing to get your hands on and to, to invest directly and be quite intimate um, with the business. So absolutely, and I think um, angel investors um, have probably always been looking for things that, that move them and, and um, they are um, com compelled by anyway. Perfect. So I'm just going to privilege one question down here by a Olivia Wales. Do you believe that impact investing is the beginning of a paradigm shift that will eventually become the new norm for investing in general? The answer to that is a resounding yes. And if we don't believe it, <laughs> if we didn't believe it, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Um, and Mark suggested at the outset that this would be a presentation that uh, was optimistic and hopeful. And so that is a great question for us to start to wrap up um, this presentation. Yes, we are optimistic. Our ideal would be, and Jamie and I talk about this often, our ideal would be that we can take the impact out of our expression and just say investing. And by definition and by uh, just the, the manner in which we think about the way capital is distributed, that it has impact and that we no longer need to delineate or make it other. It just becomes the way in which we think about investing. So yes, Olivia, we would love for that to be the new norm and the way that investing is done going forward. Jamie, any kind of closing thoughts on that? Um, yeah, the fact that we are talking about responsible investment and ethical investment as a thing that is different, as a bit of an indictment of what we've made normal, um, that the normal is not that by definition or naturally. Um, so absolutely, yes. Will there always be problems that we try and solve in innovative ways and we may call that impact investment? Yeah, probably, but hopefully that's um, you know, a moving feast where that, that, that keeps moving and moving. Um, just, just finally, last 20 seconds, I can see lots of questions which I'd love to jump into. We can't do them all. How is impact measured and quantified? We, we showed you a model of how logic is understood, but there's frameworks you can wrap around that, um, which can be easily Googled. Look up um, impact management project, um, social return on investment, the, the sustainable development goals, frame problems, and think about um, you know, what's driving, um, what, how are those problems, and therefore what would investable solutions look like, um, and that kind of thing. Um, but we, um, I think we're volunteering to um, to answer these questions in writing as well. So we will get those answers out um, along with this video. And when we say we're volunteering, that really means that we, Jamie, if you would just like to answer those questions, that would be fabulous. That's how we roll, right? I'm older. Folks, uh, it's just on nine o'clock and we know that for many of you, we are now standing between you and uh, for some, your next glass of wine, for some, your first glass of wine. So can I say that on behalf of the team, the Raising the Bar team, thank you very much for tuning into this home edition. As Mark said, there's been six series of um, speakers over six weeks. If you haven't seen them, please take the time to uh, sit back and enjoy them. They're all great presentations. This is the very last one. So as I said at the beginning, well done to the team who have pulled this series of events together. You will most definitely be looking forward to a break on your Wednesday evenings and enjoying a glass of wine to celebrate. So on behalf of us all, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for sharing in the topic of investment, of impact investment. And we very much hope that we have left you with a sense of optimism and hope that there are enterprises out there, there are entrepreneurs out there, and there is capital following that is intended to, to make an impact and to hopefully address some of the, the challenges that we are facing. So 
good night or good day wherever you are and uh, we hope we see you next year perhaps in a bar or maybe even back on Zoom. Bye for now. <laughs>